what we are going to do now is take one specific example of this in order to understand that and the example is going to be matrix multiplication what is matrix multiplication right i mean this is the very uh, i mean i'm just if i show you a 2 cross 2 uh, into 2 cross 2 matrix multiplication then effectively what we have is the i j th entry in c is done by taking a i k that is to say the k th column of the a matrix uh, k th row of the a matrix and the b k j right which is the k th column right so this will be the k th row and this will be the k th column right you take the dot product of those two right basically point wise add uh, multiply and add and you come up with this value cij okay all right now in terms of visualizing it effectively you know this is another way of looking at it you have this uh, a matrix which is m cross k in general and the b matrix has to be k cross n with the result it's going to be m cross n okay so this k over here capital k has to be the same otherwise you cannot multiply the two together okay and what i have drawn over here is just another illustration of what i said in the previous uh, uh, slide which is that i take the i th row vary k so that i get all the different entries in that row and over here oh, uh, sorry it is sorry uh, it's not the k th row and k th column i should say the i th row and the j th column okay which basically gives you the c i j right so similarly over here what we have is this is going to be the i th row and this is going to be the j th column i take the dot product between the two and i finally end up with the c i j okay now let's think briefly about how matrices are stored in memory right typically what happens is a two dimensional matrix right so if this is m rows k columns right the way that this would get stored into memory would be i would take the first row then the second row and the third row and so on okay so because after all memory is linear right it does not have a two dimensional structure naturally right all that i have is a continuous sequence of memory locations into which i can write data which means that if i have a two dimensional matrix then ultimately i have to somehow unroll it out into a one dimensional sequence of numbers okay and the typical way by which this is done is to take it one row at a time i take the first row put it into a uh, set of consecutive memory locations then take the second row put it immediately starting after the first row and so on right this is the so called row major representation right now the other possibility is to say i will take the first column and put that into memory take the second column put that over here and so on right so what happens over here this is called the column major representation right and if you think about it there's nothing really preventing you from having stored the data in this way either right there's nothing actually fundamentally special about row major that says that this is superior right and in fact if you go look at the programming languages you will find that actually fortran uses a column major representation versus c which uses a row major representation unfortunately it's not as simple as that what ends up happening is that depending on whether you have chosen row major or column major it affects the way that data comes into your cache right because remember how caches work if i try to access the you know some element some memory location number x right typically what it lets you miss that i am also going to then want to access x plus 1 x plus 2 x plus 3 and so on right or some neighborhood around x and just pull that entire neighborhood into the cache right 
Now, if you have a column major representation, but you are trying to access your matrix row wise, that is to say all the elements in one row, then that essentially defeats the whole purpose of the cache. Okay. How does a programming language decide row major or column major? See, if you think about it, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, after all, all that it means is in the programming language, if I write, let's say, A of I of J, right? This is C, right? Uh, or C++, right? This just means that A of I of J basically will be some star of A, which is the pointer plus uh, i minus 1 uh, or rather i into k plus j. Okay. This is essentially what we mean by row major. Right. What I am saying is that this corresponds to the i row j -th column. Right. Whereas column major would essentially mean if I had Fortran, then I would essentially say if I access A of, I believe the format they use is I comma J, this would essentially correspond to, I now need to go up to the Jth column, right? So I would basically say A of uh, I plus M into J. Okay. So that's all I mean when I say that row major versus column major, right? It just means that am I storing the consecutive uh, data according to, you know, by scanning along the rows or by, by the columns, right? So let's say in a C program where I have stored everything in a row major format, right? I write a program which actually tries to go down along the column. What will it do? It will essentially sort of read, uh, you know, this element, this element, this element, this would be column axis on row major data, which according to the way that we understand caches is a bad idea. Okay. That's one of the things that we need to take care of when we are implementing something like matrix multiplication. Okay. So let's try and first understand the computational complexity involved in matrix multiplication, right? So I'm going to assume for simplicity that I'm dealing with square, square matrices where M is equal to N is equal to K. In general, I just use the letter N to refer to the size. Okay. So the number of computations is order of N cubed. Okay. Why is that? Because if you go look at this thing, this essentially involves N mult and n minus 1 add right which is basically o of n operations okay uh, yeah and how many such values need to be computed n square because the size of c is n cross n so order of n cubed computations are required, but if the amount of data that I need to read, if I look at it, right, there are n squared values in the A matrix, n squared values in the B matrix, and I need to generate an output n squared values as well. 3 n squared is basically still order of n squared, right? So the big O notation says that the constant multiplication, the 3 is irrelevant, right? Because as I go to larger and larger matrices, the n is what dominates, the 3 remains a constant. And what I end up having is the number of computations grows as n cubed, but the amount of data that I need grows only as order of n squared. Okay. Which means that I now end up with n computations to be performed per data value that is being read. Okay. And the term that is often used for this is to say that this is something called the computational complexity or the compute complexity. In general, what I would like is to have as much compute as possible for each data that is read from memory. Okay, I would like to minimize the amount of um, data that I need to read in order to compute. Of course, I need to read a minimum of O of n squared data just to get all the data in. But I would like to avoid reading the same values again and again. Okay, 
Now let's take, uh, take a look at a sample code and see what happens, right? So this is sort of the most trivial way of writing it. I just have a three nested loop over here, right? So Cij is computed as Aik into Bkj. Of course, I'm assuming that, you know, the initialization of Cij equal to zero, etc. is done somewhere outside. Okay. So in which case, let's look at how this uh, computation is going to happen, right? How many times is each value of A being read from memory? Okay. If I look at it, what is going to happen is I will first read A00, then I will read A01, etc. up to A0 and minus 1. Okay. So all those values are read once in the innermost loop. Next time around, what do I read? I read a10 up to a1 and minus 1. This part corresponds to j equal to 0. And then the same thing repeats for j equal to 1, j equal to 2 and so on. Right? In other words, I will go through that same iteration of the i has not changed. i is still equal to 0, which means a00 up to a0 and minus 1 will go through for one run of k. Once again, j equal to 1, I will again end up reading the same thing and so on, right? So overall, how many times will I end up reading each value of a from memory? n times, right? There were n square data points. Each one is being read n times. So effectively, I will need to read n cubed values from memory, okay? What about b? Same story, right? Now, on the other hand, Let's go back and look at what is happening with A, right? Supposing I could take this entire A00 up to A0 and minus 1 and store it in cache memory, right? Supposing my the size of the cache was such that one entire row can fit in cache memory. Then what will happen is effectively for j equal to 0 and after the j equal to 1, j equal to 2, etc., I effectively a values are read only once, right? Because once the A00 to A0 n minus 1 is sitting in cache, it's used for all J values. Okay. And then I actually never need to get A00 again. Once I go to I equal to 1, I will never again have to read A00. I will only read A10 from that point onwards. Okay. So in other words, from main memory, I have pulled in A00 up to A0 and minus 1 just once, put them in the cache because the cache was large enough to fit one row of the uh, matrix. But I'm also assuming that the cache is not large enough to accommodate the full matrix, n cross n, right? Because let's say that, you know, n is 1000, right? So I'm trying to multiply 1000 cross 1000 matrices. Then 1000 is easy. It's like 1 kilobyte or 4 kilobytes of memory that I need. Whereas 1000 into 1000 is megabytes, okay? It's much more likely that I have a cache in the range of kilobyte size than of megabytes, okay? That's essentially what we are considering over here. The problem is it doesn't solve the issue as far as B is concerned because for B, I still have the problem that J is changing, so it cannot be cached in the same way, right? So B still ends up being read n times, okay? And this is an issue. This is something that I would like to see if I can somehow avoid. Is there some way by which I can avoid reading the B values again and again from main memory n times, okay? Now, another way of doing this, right, is an interesting approach to the problem, which is essentially called an outer product way of computing the matrix, right? Look at what is happening over here. The K index is outermost, right? And what, but what I'm doing is I'm basically taking Cij and saying that it is still equal to this product out here, okay? What it means is that for a given value of K, right, I am going to end up updating all the Cij values. Right? So I'll basically get all the AIK values, all the BKJ values, use them once over here. 
And once I have run through this, so for example, A0, 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 etc. I go through all of these, right, corresponding to the different values of K. Uh, or, no, sorry, A0, A1, A2, etc. Right? After that, I finish this once, then AI0 is never needed again. Right? So, in other words, if I can put that K in the outermost loop, how does this do the matrix multiplication? Effectively, what I am doing is I am creating one matrix that I will call, let's say, C0, right? Which basically corresponds to the A column number K, right? And B, right? And I am effectively sort of taking the dot, the point by point product. Right? So, this will essentially correspond to this. This will correspond to something out here. Right? It is a single multiplication, there is no multiply add. But what is ending up happening is I create one matrix like this, then I create another matrix C1, then I create a matrix C2 and I add all of these together to give me my C. Okay? Now, you might wonder what have you done? You have essentially rather than trying to create one matrix C, you are telling me that I have to create n different matrices. Okay? But imagine a scenario where for example A is of size 1000 cross 100 and B is of size 100 cross 1000 uh, or rather the other way around, sorry. 100 cross 1000 and this is of size 1000 cross 100, right? What this means is C is going to be of size 100 cross 100. Okay. It is a sort of peculiar situation, maybe not very common, but there can be scenarios where something like this happens. Right. And if this happens, then A or B individually are too big to fit in the cache. But C, the total number of elements required for C is one tenth of the size of A and B. Okay. Which basically means that now it, there is a possibility that the C matrix can fit completely in the cache. And then if we look at that, then you know this entire thing that I need to do, this multiplying and adding it over here, now suddenly becomes very effective. Because these accesses that I need to do over here are just from the cache memory. I need to take something from cache memory, add something after multiplying and put it back into the cache memory. Very fast, very efficient. Okay. So, what this has done is it is basically saying that look there is a different way of taking the same problem. Both of these from a pure computational complexity point of view are exactly the same. Both are going to take order of n cubed operations. But from a cache friendliness nature or the behavior of the cache, they have very different performance. I can go one step further and sort of say I will do tiling. And this is one of the optimizations that we had talked about when we were discussing the compiler optimizations. All right, so C is a big matrix, right? Can I consider a small part of C, right? I'll call this a tile, right? And basically say that I have many such tiles that need to be computed. And what do I have for that? I essentially will end up with, this will also be pr produced as a product of a and B, right? But I would essentially have something which says that all of this, right, this band out here is what is required in order to compute this tile that I have marked. Okay. Now that band also contributes to some other parts of the thing. So for example, this band, if I combine it with this one over here, will give me that same band of A combined with the other green band on B will give me the green tile in C. Okay. Now, how is that useful? Because now things start to get interesting. You remember the problem that we faced earlier. The, the issue that we had was I can read A and I can cache it. I can similarly read A, B and I can cache or I could have something where, you know, maybe I can just take uh, a small, a relatively small sized C and say that, you know, I would try and have this sitting uh, in the form of the, uh, out, uh, you know, use the outer product method in order to compute that, right? 
The outer product method is nice because it basically means that whatever are the data corresponding to that need to be only read once. Okay. Now what I have done is I have essentially taken one small tile of C and said that I will rewrite it in such a way that I am doing the outer product just for that small tile alone. Okay. So even though C was large, this tile is small. It will definitely fit within the cache. I can choose it with the size of you know m tile and n tile, these values, in such a way that it fits nicely within the cache. Okay, and I get the benefit of better performance. Okay, uh, you may recall that when we talked about compiler optimizations, we essentially said something about loop tiling, right? This is basically the context in which it comes in, right? So loop tiling, just like this loop unrolling and loop un uh, the code hoisting and various other optimizations. Loop tiling means that we basically break up the loop into a structure like this. Again, from the pure computational complexity point of view, this is useless. Why would I do something of this sort? Right? This becomes useful only when you bring in the aspect of the cache. That is to say, once the cache is brought into the picture, it actually has a different performance than what it would have been with if all memories were accessed with the same uh, delay. Okay. Now, does this solve the problem completely? No, because I will still probably need to read the values of A and B multiple times. It's just that I may not need to read each element in A n times. I might be able to read it just n divided by n tile number of times. Okay. So if A is of size 1000, and the n tile, the tiling size is just of size 10 even, right? It means that every element in A, I will need to read 1000 by 10 or 100 times, which is still far better than reading it 1000 times.